Papa Paz you expect late in the afternoon. That's <laughs> thank you very much. <laughs> uh, appreciate everybody for being here and uh, and one of the things during the uh, IFMET report and and Adrian talked about you noticed is like the in addition to the 800 vacancies, there's 200 vacancies in the Bureau of Indian Affairs that's gone on the last three years. And many of those vacancies are dealing with forest managers and regional foresters that have retired. And, and where, are the le where are the leaders coming from is something that's not talked about very much, especially in Indian country, as many of you in Natural Rio, especially forestry, there seems to be two levels of training in Indian country. It's like you're a crew boss, or your tribal chair, and, you know. There's tra there's institutes that work with tribal council, and as far as in the tribal community, where's where's the training for the mid-level manager there? And even in um, agriculture and forestry in general, uh, there's really a bit of lack, and that was back in uh, back in the 70s. Uh, if you remember back then, there was a weed embargo. Um, President Carter put a weed embargo back in the 70s, but even though they put this weed embargo, there wasn't any input from agriculture or the wheat growers. And the wheat growers complained about there wasn't anybody to speak for the wheat growers with this uh, weed embargo. And then they looked amongst each other and, and said, well, we need to speak for ourselves or we need to develop our leadership to put influence and, and get elected into Congress so we can provide input into things like weed embargo. So that's when uh, agriculture leadership, and I'll talk about how the Kellogg Foundation was an organization that started to get involved, that there was, that there was groups of these agriculture organizations that said, well, let's do something about it. And also, we're, that's something that the IFMET report was uh, coming up with. So. The outline for today, Mary and I, just like our ag forestry policy thing we did together, it's a team approach. So I'm providing the beginning or overview and then in the middle of the meat of the sandwich, you know, Mary and I will talk about our ag forestry, kind of a little reminiscing about our, our experiences with our 18 months in ag forestry. Mine was 20, over 20 years ago. But the IFMAT recommendation passed, uh, I'll also talk about past BIA ITC leadership efforts. There has been things that go on. I mentioned the Kellogg Foundation. Uh, the meat of the sandwich is our experience with the Washington Ag Forestry Leadership. There was a, there was a uh, National Ag Forestry Leadership Review conducted by the University of Florida, the Wedgworth Institute that worked with the University of Florida. And next steps, uh, kind of some recommendations. Uh, the IFMAT recommendation, uh, the recommendation was a strategy similar to the National Agriculture Leadership Network should be developed that allows tribes, BIA, and ITC to work together to address the leadership and upper level management skills needed to identify in the workforce survey. That was something the number one, when there was a survey done in 2012, they asked the participants at a national meeting what was the need that they saw for for training and this leadership was was number one. Also continued with that recommendation, funds should be available to contract with ITC or another entity to organize and host a regional leadership training programs. That's on page 139 and IFMET 2, uh, or IFMET 3, excuse me, uh, the volume 2 report. Past, uh, what has been done in the past, unless you've been around, unless maybe you're Larry Blythe or, or George Smith, that this is the, the Office of Technical Assistance and Training back in 1980, uh, Brigham City, Utah, uh, provided some training to forestry personnel, a national program, and that's George Smith right there, who's now working here at Coquille, and right there is Larry Blythe, sitting right up front. So that's how long Larry's been around. Larry last night was mentioning about how long he's been with ITC. But, and I'm, as usual, the non-leader, I am actually way in the back, my, my usual spot. But uh, mentioned that this uh, 1980 National Program Orientation, there was a week-long week session that talked about Indian law, uh, the, the uh, 
the federal regulations and the bureau manual. That's something that you never see at a national level or maybe even regional level that you never really hear about. Um, that was 1980. Then in night, between 1990 and 1992, the Bureau of Indian Affairs and the Intertribal Timber Council looked at some leadership, uh, like two or three years, the University of Idaho developed uh, this executive leadership of political and social forces in tribal natural resource management. And it was a week-long session, and here's a copy of the seminar, uh, what were the, uh, the, ob the objectives of this to increase the ability of tribal and bureau leaders, managers to work together to meet landowners' goals, um, to the leaders to understand each other to the point of view and environment with which they must operate, and three, identify the realistic ways to avoid or resolve conflicts in regarding natural resource management issues, really getting a lot of the things that Mary and I will talk about what we went through at our leadership. Uh, look at improving the Bureau's performance both as a trustee and service provider uh, to improve communications between tribes, Bureau, and other parties involved with natural resource management, decision making, and administration, and to improve the performance of the Bureau as a land resource management agency. There was two or three of these workshops done done in the early 90s and had great uh, reviews, but then uh, as many of you knew or know that uh, this, was, this was sponsored and coordinated through the regional office and there's not very many people, there's not very many people in a regional office anymore. That was the marketing, Gary Sims was somebody who was the marketing, ma uh, marketing uh, forester that left. Uh, Again, this was the copy of what the program looked like and who was the participants, BIA leaders, tribal leaders, uh, tribal and BIA forest managers, uh, role play exercise, three day, and we still have the dialogue from the leadership. Uh, that's one of the things the ITC even, I didn't mention today or earlier, but we do videotape all the uh, these PowerPoints that'll be streaming video and available for online so if people were people, some saw some people taking notes, but uh, at the end of the symposium in about a month, you should be able to go online and see all these presentations. Some of the ones that you may have missed, you'll be able to see. Um, we'll move on to the uh, Kellogg Foundation. I mentioned a quick little bit about the background. Uh, mentioned that they started to do, um, there was some initial uh, states that started an ag program, but then I mentioned before with the weed embargo uh, with President Carter, that's when a lot of states got involved that included Washington uh, and uh, Oklahoma. Remember those two particular state programs, it'll be something that will uh, be highlighted and the, the national report will actually highlight these two, uh, these two states. And as you can see, the growth of the program up until 2000. And the Kellogg Foundation, why is it successful? Here's the model, uh, the program profile of all those about 23 states that have these ag forestry programs. Uh, the average program is 15 years old. Nearly half the programs operate out of universities. One third are coordinated by private or nonprofit organizations or foundations. And uh, the rest of the administra administra is administered through combinations of collaborative sources, and that's where there's a lot of their funding that comes from. Uh, most programs follow similar framework, which is typically 18 months, which is what Mary and I went through. To t it was 18 months with ag forestry, and includes 20 to 30 people who are in the, in the age, age range of 20 to 50 years old. As I mentioned before, it seemed like it's either a crew boss, you know, when you're just out of high school, or tribal chair, maybe when you're, you're in your 50s and 60s, but when it comes to your mid-level managers, there's a lack, but this is one of the programs that addresses that. Program content typically ranges from local to state, national, and international uh, issues. Most programs include a national and international travel seminar. Uh, 
Nearly two-thirds of the program indicate there's no other leadership program with similar goals in their state, even states where there's parallel leadership programs exist. Uh, directors uh, often view them as aug augmenting and not really comprehensive. And as Mary and I will share the curriculum of maybe why it, this particular program is more, uh, uh, more comprehensive, even more than when we showed you, when I showed you the uh, ITC one that we did a couple or 20 years ago. It's a little more, a lot more comprehensive and what, what the benefits are. Uh, and then down here at the end, the agriculture producers represent about half the participants. Another 20% are agribusiness. The rest include agriculture organizations, rural leaders, government officials, and other involved with agriculture policy making. The, the state of Washington program is probably the most diversified one. Uh, uh, aquaculture, organic farmers, environmentalists we had in ours, and the mayor of Walla Walla was in our class. Uh, now that was the, uh, the Kellogg Foundation, and now we'll start going into the Washington Ag Forestry Leadership Program. Maybe uh, the background that you just don't sign an application and they say, okay, you know, you're in the program, but uh, there's an application that each participant sends in uh, recommendations. Uh, the, uh, Jamie Pinkham, who was the former president of ITC, he was a uh, uh, Department of Natural Resource Forester with the state of Washington, went through the program. I, I knew Jamie and his family, and, and Jamie knew that I was involved with, or I think at the time I was, uh, forest manager at Umatilla, and he, he talked about the program and the benefit of the program and thought I would be a good candidate. Uh, part of the application, it's just like a job application. When you send it in, and one of the key elements of the application is, is how much volunteer time do you do with your community? Or is there even a proposal for a, a project, a policy project? That's something of the outcome that, that you just don't participate in this leadership program, but there's actually a product that comes out. Some, some teams in our class actually came out with legislation. Some of the legislation actually got passed. That's how successful. And one of the applicate, my application, or just real quick, was actu actually youth camp. Not so much youth camp, but dropout. That's what our, our group talked about. But anyway, uh, you put in the application, you get recommendations from your supervisor, the tribe, I was up at Spokane at the time, and also peop, uh, past uh, participants like Jamie Pinkham. Then you go actually go into a job interview. There's a panel that reviews your, uh, your application, your recommendations, and you go through a panel, and then selected uh, 30 class members at Ag Forestry. There's probably an average of, of uh, 45 to 60 applicants each time. And then the curriculum. And then later on, I'll also talk about the funding and sustainability of these programs or why I think ag forestry is about the same age as ITC. They're getting close to their 40th year. Uh, this is the website, the front page for the ag forestry program for, uh, for the uh, Washington Ag Leadership Program. And you may wonder, or maybe you can see why the IFMAT team when the IFMAT team did site visits, one of the things they did ask the tribes about, uh, who are your leaders or where did they get their training? So when, when they went to like Nez Perce, uh, Jamie Pinkham, they could mention that Jamie Pinkham was part of this program. At Yakima, they mentioned uh, Phil Rignan. So we actually have two ITC presidents that have gone through the program. Uh, other Yakima tribal members, uh, this Nez Perce, uh, Jeff Sampson, Edwin Lewis, uh, former uh, forest manager at Yakima, Willie Schuster, who is the current forest manager at Yakima. He's just graduated the program, I believe. Uh, other tribes, uh, maybe some of you recognize, uh, we do have the Truman D. Picard scholarship, but Truman's brother, Louis Picard, who works at the Colville Mill, uh, the Colville Tribal Mill, uh, is at uh, has gone through the program. Jim Erickson, who's our fire technical specialist, 
has been through the program. And of course, myself back 1992 is when I went through the program. So when the, uh, the IFMAT team did their site visits, when they visited Mary up, up at Macaw, you know, so those are some of the questions they were asking of a lot of these successful programs like at Colville, Macaw, uh, Yakima, Nez Perce, uh, they could see that one of, the, one of the reasons why a lot of these tribal programs were successful was because of the leadership that was gained through this found particular foundation. And I guess now Mary and I can kind of share our experiences. As, you, as I mentioned, uh, kind of the, uh, we've divided this up into three sections. When you go through the Ag Forestry Program, there's actually 14 sections, and maybe the tough one, toughest one is maybe what we call the boot camp. And the thing that most people are afraid of is, is public speaking in the media, and they get right into it. They said, if you're going to be a leader, that's something you're going to have to deal with, is um, leadership, communication, and visit. One of the things, you get uh, 30 people in a cohort, there's 30 type A people, and you're, you're up there, you know. <laughs> you get your nickname real fast. That's one of the things that's kind of fun, and hopefully, you know, if you have a good sense of humor, if you have a bad nickname and a good sense of humor, you'll get a better nickname. <laughs> that's one thing you learn, probably as a leader. Uh, there's group dynamics and public speaking, and, and at, as you, develop your group dynamics, you'll actually develop your team. Out of the 30 people, there are six groups of four. So uh, there was four of us that worked on our public policy, which was, uh, teenage, or was high school dropouts is what we worked on. And then public speaking, it was a five-minute um, five minute speech. The interesting thing that Phil Rigdon experienced was one of the reasons why it's a five-minute speech, because when you testify in front of Congress or any legislative body, it's five minutes. And so that's why you practice five minutes in this. That's a reason, because, uh, and that's what uh, Phil has been going through for the last couple months, is actually going in front of Congress. And he knows he has five minutes to speak, and they actually start out uh, the reason why your, your, your speech is five minutes. And then working with the media, uh, they actually bring in uh, TV, they bring you into the TV station, you actually go through, talk with newspaper, you get interviewed by a newspaper, interviewed by radio, uh, uh, news people, and a TV, um, TV interview, work with press, uh, develop press releases, and the funny thing was the uh, TV interview that, that everybody gets recorded, and everybody gets critiqued, so you get critiqued by your classmates, 30 of us. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's, that's a really interesting process. So maybe Barry could talk about her s experience with kind of the, the boot camp. Thank you, Don. Um, I just wanted to say real quickly my experience just generally with the leadership program uh, in being selected as one of 30 people. There was, um, you know, I had, you know, uh, was here with the Intertribal Timber Council and knew Don and Jamie and and Jim, and who encouraged, you know, um, the application to the ag forestry, and um, you know, if you're it, it pr pretty much folks are mid-career, um, as Don said, they're you know 30 to 50 years old, and I was kind of right in that 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 age at at that time. Um, you know, ag forestry is about half for, uh, from Eastern Washington, half from Western Washington. Um, half, uh, in the, I think there were 20 men and, and uh, 10 women in, in our class. And they pretty much want that even uh, because you're always, um, because they're saving money and when we're meeting once a month and then traveling on the national trip in, to Washington, uh, that's you know two weeks and then you travel internationally for three weeks so you, you're, you're, um, you've got a roommate every time. So, and so you're learning compatibility. Uh, the other thing I wanted to say about the, at least my experience with ag forestry is that um, there were, um, it was mostly con very conservative. <laughs> so there were four people that were uh, fairly liberal leaning, you know, and the rest of them were also, they were, they were a very conservative, conservative group. Um, I was the only native in, in the, and it was a all uh, Caucasian um, group, which, you know, I mean, it would just, um, 
And we had, uh, yeah, so the boot camp was, uh, you know, getting started was, was interesting. Even that first uh, initial interview, you know, where it's like Don said, it's, it's pretty intense and, you know, it's competitive and you're in there and y you, you want it, but, you know, it's, it's, you know it's, it's nothing like I had been through. But I, I remember from that interview, um, and I've used this question since then, um, when they asked you um, what one word describes your describes you not your management style not you know any other part but what one word describes you it's like wow you know and try to think of that right away and so I put other people on the spot you know because I think it's a good question because it really makes you think you know just just who are you and, um, and what are you what are you doing there you know in that in that particular moment and what are you uh, aiming to achieve in your career and in your life um, I think with uh, um, the communication, as Don said, that's uh, that was really important. And, and being in the boot camp and and you know having that kind of uh, experience where you are you're front and center. You know you've got you've got the camera on you. You've got uh, you know you're 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 talking about issues of, of importance of the day. You know whether it's Department of Ecology, Depart the Bureau of Indian Affairs. You know the things that are making a difference to. Um, folks in agriculture and forestry. Um, and I think that, uh, what else was I going to say? I think is that kind of, are, are we tag teaming here? Do you want me to just kind of? Just keep, you can keep or move with the. Uh, and I'll just say real quickly that, you know, one of the things that, of course, in working in, in forestry is that you're, and I, I spent 25 years in forestry and uh, and my, your focus is forestry. Your focus is on natural resource management. It's working with fisheries, with your environmental folks. Um, uh, but it's pretty, you know, it's pretty focused. And so, working with the the social issues, um, with social services, with law enforcement, with the uh, uh, criminal investigation, it really broadened your um, experience and what you were. Uh, working with this, is this the curriculum sessions? Yeah, so forestry, agriculture, looking at the river systems, crime and corrections, transportation. Um, it was, uh, you know, just, it was a, a, a really well-rounded uh, curriculum. The um, international session, trade, culture, and government for, for my uh, class 23, we went to uh, China and Vietnam for three weeks. And, um, you know, just, in, before that, as a as a um, reservation Indian, I never really, you know, I traveled throughout, you know, through intertribal timber council throughout the country to different timber owning tribes and in uh, Canada and you know Mexico, and really never saw myself as being anywhere else in the world. Just never really thought about it. You know, you're raising kids and you're, you know, just you know, you're living your life. But going to to China and, and Vietnam really opened my eyes to the world, and um, and it, 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 it sparked a desire in me. And I've been back to China three other times since then on different, um, uh, as part of delegations and as a consultant working with um, the Chinese uh, Park Service in their, uh, how they exhibit and how they uh, interpret Tibetan culture. So it's really pretty <coughs> interesting. And uh, public policy presentations, um, as, as uh, Don was mentioning, we worked with the uh, carbon market, so I had some real high-powered foresters in my little group that, and that's what we worked on. And it was it was hot and it was current and um, and it's still an ongoing uh, issue. Um, and it, in terms of uh, what it did for me, I as in my career at that point, you know, I I um, I was it was like um, mid-career for me, and uh, I was a busy person. You know what they say? They say. If you want to get something done, ask a busy person because <laughs> that's the person that's going to do it. And that's that was kind of you know you're like you know the, the, the class A the or the type A um, busy people. And I was on a lot of committees and uh, and once I was on a committee or a board, generally I became the president or the, the chair just because that's what you want to do. You want to be able to to lead it in 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 uh, you know uh, at any rate that it um, it really opened things up for me. And I remember the uh, one of the persuasive speeches that we did at Agriculture and Forestry. And what they would do is they would, in in my class anyway, is you know what you met once a month, and they would take these different um, topics, 
and at lunch or at dinner they would put these somebody would have a topic under their coffee cup you didn't know if it was going to be you or you know and then all of a sudden you would look and there was your your topic and you would have to stand up and give a you know a one to three minute speech on you know just some random topic and uh, it was pretty scary I mean it was pretty it was pretty um, nerve-wracking and overwhelming but you you learn to live with it you know and you, you learn to um, live with the people that you that you were in the class with and, and learn to um, respect them and uh, respect the opposing views because there were a lot of different opposing views, at least where I was concerned, you know. Um, let's see. I think that's kind of, I don't know. I'll, I'll, I'll turn it back over to you, Don. Thanks. Okay, thanks, Mary. Mm -hmm. Hopefully we'll have some questions on um, our experiences. And, and again, that's what... Um, the things that we remember or even our five minute our five minute speech that I remember back in 1991 what mine was about almost more of the image because the class would vote on things they put you on the spot they who's the leaders of the leaders even that that they did the nicknames and cohorts and and my one of my speech was up maybe the top five anyway because I talked about a chainsaw grandma and I, I don't want to go into the speech, but they because you hear 30 speeches out of 30 speeches, which one you would which one would you vote or remember? That's the one. But it was actually the image of a chainsaw grandma. It was part of a fire crew that we actually did have a chainsaw grandma on our fire crew. But um, going through uh, kind of what the once you get out of the boot camp, you go into kind of the social issues the first year. Uh, you talk about state and local governments, the national uh, government. There's a week-long session in Washington, D.C., where you go to D.C. And if you have your congressional representative, this is actually my neighbor, um, uh, Sid Morrison from the state of Washington. He owned an apple orchard probably about half a mile from the place I was staying at the particular time. So it was kind of interesting where we got to talk about our neighbors when we were at, at the... Uh, at the session and, and Phil Rigdon who recently testified that uh, Dan Newhouse was one of the representatives on the Natural Resource Committee and Dan Newhouse ha actually had gone through the Ag Forestry Program so that's one thing that Phil had a common bond with is, is through this program. So uh, the other thing that, that's important uh, as far as a leader is actually with family and that's one of the things, there's several sessions where the spouse can attend, where my wife did it, actually attend. The workshop uh, mentioned that we did actually talk about forestry things that uh, Dave Hike, who is a, uh, is a scientist and, and taught it right here, taught at University of Washington, brought us to the work with the warehouser, so we went to the warehouser technical center. So that was quite a treat. Crime and corrections, we went to the Walla Walla State Pen and, and something that people don't get to see was actually death row and and as a, people talk about those things but i think as a leader you need to know all parts of society that's that's one reason why they brought our class to death row because you have to when people talk talking about it and seeing it are two different things just like when we were talking about law like a logger that that if you see death row and actually see the people men you know, 90% of the 90% of the uh, the prison system are men, and that's that's something that stuck a number that stuck with me for over 20 some years. Uh, but I put this in. Mary mentioned that uh, I also went to China. The one thing back in 1992, they uh, there were there, in Beijing. There was only like 5,000 cars for six million people. It was all bicycles. And they hauled everything on bicycles. Even we counted one time there was 72 chickens on a bike that we sat there. And said, I wonder how many chickens that guy's going to put on his bike. So that, as far as our class image that we remember, it was just like in China back then. They were hauling everything on bikes. Um, funding and sustainability with the program always. There's the question of how much does it cost? And this is some numbers back in... Uh, 1992 or the other thing when you go through the class is is that you become an advocate for the class that you actually you do tra now they're doing training 
in um, uh, fundraising is when you're a class member they expect you to give back and I've given back for over usually at least $250 a year back to the class but you imagine if you multiply 30 um, 30 participants over 30 years and it's if they each gave $100 or each gave $250 you know that's that's quite a bit you know that's that's sustainable so oops but anyway um, but back then about $10,000 was the cost for each participant we had in kind by the universities there was some foundation resources participant resources that out of our own pocket with uh, travel and in kind from our uh, employers at that time there at Spokane agencies and as, a, as I mentioned before many many partners corporate individual and grants um, back in 2012 that was the Ag Forestry program but uh, Mary and I I think we might have talked about but we received an uh, email uh, all the Ag Forestry uh, participants uh, and here they show well this is actually 2014 and there's highlighted that the University of Florida did an ag leadership study and contacted all these organizations about sending emails out to their participants and develop you know a survey a report and recommendations and I had I talked with I read this and and talked about uh, the IFMET report and leadership and some interesting um, outcomes of this with the uh, with the leadership of the survey uh, 28 programs about 3,000 participants up here uh, 3,100 uh, out of that there was uh, 84 participants that were uh, uh, American Indian or native 3% of the population of the survey which is actually high which is a high rate and so uh, uh, 80, yeah, 84 or 3 percent and then I called I talked with the director uh, the Wedgworth director to ask him I said well where did all these participants come from from the native population he said well there was two states that had a high rate of, of American Indian Alaska Native and that was Washington State and Oklahoma so those two particular programs there's something there to research and say well why are they successful why are, why are these two states with their universities and their agriculture and, and forestry groups why are they successful um, one of the things that this report came out with uh, they were looking at best program uh, best um, practices of which Mary and I kind of explained our the curriculum that what they went through and then there was two needs that all these um, 28 programs that they reviewed was because of the changing media social media uh, the need for more media training that was the thing that they lacked or keeping up all these other policy group dynamics but the one thing that was changing uh, that was constantly changing was media so the constant need for media training and also because of the age group uh, leadership transition training that's the other thing when we think about of our a lot of our organizations our tribes is that was something that the organizations talked about say their FFA or 4-H groups the leadership and those um, next steps for IFMAT 2 recommend or IFMAT 3 recommendations uh, just some ideas um, I talked with Mary a little bit about uh, because we went through the program a lot of us have gone through the program we've actually seen the, the uh, but some ideas is actually develop regional leadership programs with partners look at the curriculum would this if we talk to a group or say a work group would this curriculum fit Indian country does it it, it seems to especially in Washington State and Oklahoma of talking with that group of what why are they successful seek feedback from different our partners universities uh, and once we develop some of these and and uh, revise maybe some of these leadership programs or curriculum uh, revise them and then start finding partnerships to actually fund these and start getting them going or the scale or how long are they going to be you know the, like ag forestry is an annual program but with Indian country does it necessarily need to be annual is it every three to five years how do you develop the the cohorts that Mary said it's very that's one of the challenges talking with the foundations 
how do you mix these personalities? <laughs> You know, because when you're with with 30 type A people for 18 days, I remember day 14, things kind of blew up. Or that's just that's just just like your family. Everything's not hunky dory. But you imagine, you know, 30 type A people together in in these buses or wherever we were going in China. I remember that. It, it's an interesting uh, interesting process. So I'd like to thank everybody, especially for staying here all day and discussing these tough topics. And again, this is one of the, the one leadership thing that I saw as leader, think, think and talk about the solution, followers think and talk about the problems. So thank you very much. <laughs> Questions? I know it's been a long day. The thing I know I'm looking forward to this is I don't want Trudy to keep asking me to do youth camps when I'm 80. That's something I'm... <laughs> my dad was at youth camps at 80, believe it or not, or that thing, but I... <laughs> it's <laughs> only as an elder, not, not organizing the youth camp. My dad would go to youth camps only as the elder. 